A very warm welcome uh, to our second day of online talks for the NHS Art Conference. Um, a big thank you to, of course, all our delegates who've joined, uh, but also all our speakers who are giving their time and their expertise on a voluntary basis, as is always the case with uh, things related to the NHS Art community. Uh, my name is Mohammed. I'm your host for the session today. Uh, I help out with NHS Art community. Um, so I'm really looking forward to an interesting, stimulating and wide ranging set of talks, just as we had yesterday. Um, for colleagues who are new to the uh, uh, the, the online um, talks today, um, if you can put your questions via the Q&A button, which should be visible to you at the um, with the controls on your Zoom uh, uh, on your Zoom screen. Um, so questions through the Q&A button, I'll be keeping an eye on those. And comments via the chat, please. Um, and um, just one bit of housekeeping. So for our speakers, um, I'll, I, will, I will give a two minute warning. Um, just uh, so please excuse the interruption, but it's just to, so we all keep the time. Um, uh, so um, just bear that in mind, really. That's not me being rude. It's just the, the, the nature of the task. Um, and um, and to colleagues uh, who've joined um, and our speakers also, if um, you know this is a two D experience, which is great. We do benefit a lot from online uh, um, interactions. Um, but the NHS Art Conference Month also has an in person three D opportunity uh, on the sixteenth and seventeenth in Birmingham, UK, uh, uh, and we're going to leave registrations open to the very last possible minute because we, we do want to try and uh, maximize the opportunity for people to, to meet in 3D and kind of uh, have the extra opportunities uh, that that brings really. So, um, so okay, so without any further ado, uh, I'm going to hand over uh, to our first speaker. Um, can I ask our speakers to do, please do take your time to do a brief introduction and then I'll hand over, and then uh, uh, kind of the floor is yours. So our first speaker actually is Benjamin. Can I hand over to Benjamin, please? Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Orada, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Benjamin Bainham, and um, I'm a Senior Improvement Analyst um, at Improvement Cymru. Um, and I'm going to hopefully describe my journey as a novice to sharing um, to, to hopefully describe my journey as a novice to our shiny creating a bilingual tool. Um, but however, during this piece of work, I was actually on secondment um, with the World Health Organization Collaborating Centre, which is um, another team um, within Public Health Wales. So hopefully I'm going to be able to condense my time during the secondment down to 15 minutes. I'm sorry. So good question, what is the purpose of the tool? So to really give some background, we wanted to create an interactive tool to accompany a discussion paper the WHO CC published um, called Influencing the Health Gap in Wales, a Decomposition Analysis, to really give a much more visual way for key stakeholders to be able to interact with the, with the data in a meaningful way. So this meant stakeholders were able to see the impact of the prevalence um, of fair slash poor health, low mental well-being, and low life satisfaction on a few measures like um, those who are able to make a saving of at least £10 a month to those who are not, who are not um, those who report being in material deprivation and those who do not, and finally those who report a limiting long-standing illness, disability or infirmity and those who do not. And how much of the gaps then can be explained by the five essential conditions for healthy prosperous lives for all, which are, so we have health and health services, health and income security and social protection, health and living conditions, health and social and human capital, and finally health and employment and working conditions. So those are the five essential conditions. So why does it need to be bilingual? Well, a couple of reasons really. Um, so just to kind of start off with awareness that some of our stakeholders are first language while speakers and some may have a preference to read in Welsh rather than English. 
And in fact, I've made a note um, on the slide that uh, in 2021, the annual population survey from the ONS um, reported that around 892,000 people aged three and above could speak Welsh. But as well as there is the Welsh Language Act. So the 1993 Act essentially outlines that English and Welsh should be treated equally in the conduct, in the conduct of public business in Wales. So let's sink our teeth in into building the actual tool. So at the beginning, I was quite fortunate in terms of I was given a bit of a sandbox really, allowing me just to test the waters with our shiny because I had no experience with it beforehand and really to see what I could create with no limits on kind of the creative freedom. And um, apologies, I'm unable to show the really rough test code that I had at the beginning. Um, as I've had some troubles regarding uh, my OneDrive since I've had a new laptop recently. So um, it's an outstanding ticket I have open um, with my AT department. So hopefully that'll be sorted soon. But um, I was able to kind of use open source data to create a variety of data visuals um, using the package Plotly as well and incorporating some of that user interactivity like dynamic dependent drop downs as well to influence the data visuals. Um, and this really aligned with a lot of the discussions I was having with my colleagues in QCC um, while they were finalizing certain aspects of their report as well. So once the report was in its initial draft, it went through numerous reviews before publication. And this is where we really started to utilize um, the skills learned previously and start to apply them to create a tool um, that was user friendly and easy to navigate. And most importantly, to kind of cater for the skill mix of users that would be interacting with the dashboard. Um, as information from the dashboard needed to be clear with the interactive data visuals with dynamic conclusions to give more background context to those data visuals. So after countless discussions and many times, which I'm sure many of you could relate to where you finish work on a bug or an issue that you hadn't managed to resolve, then as soon as you close your eyes, drift off to sleep, an idea hits you and you immediately jolt up and you grab the nearest pen and paper somewhere um, just to write it down somewhere to avoid any risk that you might forget it by the time morning rolls around. Um, so after numerous occasions like that, we were able to get the dashboard to this stage. Um, for me personally, I was pretty happy with this and um, the fact that I was capable of doing this and I loved every aspect because to me, it felt like a fun puzzle solving exercise. Um, however, I knew deep down that it was good, but not the best that I could make as some parts of the dashboard were quite clunky and some of the formatting was off. And most importantly, because I tried keeping the dashboard as one, there were some errors when you change the language to Welsh. Um, for example, some of the values wouldn't calculate and the charts would remain in English. So I had to seek advice from friends within Public Health Wales and find some learning online. And one solution that came up um, was to split the dashboard into two and use hyperlinks in the header to connect the two dashboards together, which to me had quite a few pros and cons to it. So these are just some of the pros and cons that I considered um, with this method. So first of all, in the pros, the code ideally should be simpler to kind of navigate because where there was quite a lot of if else kind of statements in terms of the argument on uh, kind of the language preference, you wouldn't you kind of be removing that. So kind of condensing that code a little bit more um, as well as there's the possibility of having Welsh and English URLs. Um, and in the short term, this method would save time because essentially it would be sort of just a kind of copy and paste kind of deal but as well as it kind of aligns with uh, the other teams in Public Health Wales that take a similar approach. And now <laughs> to talk about some of the kind of cons with it. So any changes that do, that happen to the data would take longer as you'd be updating two separate data sets ideally, um, and you'd have to be managed. So that kind of incorporates with you be managing two dashboards rather than one. And then this is where I come to my final point with the cons because you're kind of doing that, error, errors may occur a little bit more frequently as a result of that. 
since you're managing two rather than the one. So after kind of careful consideration, I decided to follow that method and separate the dashboard into two. Um, there were other solutions that involved using other packages, um, but it would have meant some serious alterations to the code would have been needed. And with the time we set for publishing, um, the time that it would take for me to kind of implement it um, wasn't realistic in terms of both kind of the capacity that I had and the time until the report was going to be published and my succumbent would be coming to an end. However, with this kind of separate dashboards, um, one in Welsh and the other in English, I was able to apply both Welsh and English URLs as previously mentioned. And of course, I need to shamelessly plug those URLs um, if people wish to take a look and play around. And who knows if it's an area of interest to you, um, definitely read the report that was published alongside of the dashboard. Um, however, this is what the dashboards look like now. So as you can see, very kind of subtle changes, but really just polishing certain aspects of the document up, aligning it with kind of the branding, ensuring that any kind of loading errors are hidden as the code will try to manipulate the data um, before the arguments of the dropdowns have loaded in. Um, as well as some major changes like the overview actually being um, populated with some more background and give a little bit more context to the picture. So just to kind of give a summary, so at first when presented with the specification for this, it was a bit daunting to begin with. And I personally feel uh, that can apply to kind of any coding language if you have, if it's something that you haven't done before. Um, but I was very fortunate to receive um, fantastic support from my colleagues, James and Ollie within the WhoCC and a lot of my own colleagues in Improvement Camry, like um, Jessica Pang, who you'll be hearing from later on today, um, as well as I was able to utilize many fantastic resources online to really kickstart my journey. Um, also the likes of Google, Stack Overflow, and um, the network I had around me were extremely useful whenever I encountered a bug that I didn't know how to fix, or a brick, or if I hit a brick wall in terms of how do I approach some of these questions and really um, helps in terms of guiding me either directly to the solutions or influencing the ideas uh, slash ways that I approach these bugs or issues. However, in the end, I enjoyed the learning and the experience it taught me. I still feel as though I'm learning new things with R every single day and I'm proud of what I've accomplished because since the start of my career, it was always something that um, I aspired to do, um, was to kind of create a fun interactive dashboard and I'm sure we'll see plenty more awesome ones today. Um, but it's really been a fantastic opportunity to kind of create my very first one. So, um, Thank you. Um, please do not hesitate to reach out if you've got any questions, whether it be on the content, this presentation, or if even if you want to share your experience of creating a bilingual dashboard, um, or even if you're starting your new journey and looking for a little bit of just someone to kind of talk to about it, really. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> That's great. Um, Benjamin, thank you. There are a round of applause for you, and lots of people are also uh, in the chat. Uh, We've got a bilingual chat going today, which is really nice, actually. Um, so thank you so much. Um, uh, Benjamin, you, you, your, your, your journey was, because uh, uh, we've, we've got a little bit of time, your journey is really interesting. Some people asked for the link to the um, to the dashboard, and that's been posted perhaps by your colleagues. Um, but one other thing was um, Colin Fay did a talk for the NHSR community a few days ago. And these were things that he wanted uh, to say, things I wish I'd known before I built my my shiny apps uh, and so on, I would highly recommend uh, uh, if there's a if people know where the link is, you can post it. But it's one that had some really really nice tips uh, on um, on lessons to learn. But your talk has highlighted the the importance of considering whether you go for two separate dashboards or integrate one. And I think that's a really important conceptual question. So thank you so much, and we love the fact that novices. Um, you're not a novice anymore, have joined us uh, uh, and we want more more to join. Well, thank you so much, uh, Benjamin. Um, I'll take advantage of the time, if I may. So uh, our next speaker is Inyaki, who is 
the person who first designed uh, and developed the discrete demand simulation package for R called Simmer. It's a great pleasure really to have package developers come and talk to us about their work. So Inyaki, if I can hand over to you, please do a brief introduction and then and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mohammed. Thank you to the organization to bring me the opportunity to be here today. Uh, I'm assistant professor of statistics at University Carlos III of Madrid. Uh, and I developed uh, this package with uh, Bart Smith, who is founder and data scientist at Data Roots IO, which is based in, in Belgium. Um, let me introduce a little bit of what, uh, um, what uh, discrete simulation is. So um, there are many, many, many fields really that use this kind of simulation because many, many problems in the real world can be modeled after discrete events that uh, happen to uh, update the state of some system. And then we can track all those changes and, and probably optimize some stuff. So typical examples of these are customers arriving at a bank, products being manipulated in a supply chain, package servers in a telecommunications networks, uh, many, many examples like this. And of course, patients traversing a resource constrained healthcare system. And I'm highlighting here three things, patients, resources, and the constraints. Because when we are uh, designing and simulating and optimizing a system like that, we want uh, mainly two views, the patient view, because uh, we are interested in the waiting times, serving times, recovery times of those patients, and also the resource view, the allocation, the scheduling, the utilization of those resources. So there are many, many possibilities of discrete event simulation. We tend to think that, uh, uh, you know, AI is just machine learning, but it's not. Uh, it's not, and in fact, it's a small part of it. Uh, all kind of simulations are, of course, uh, AI, and many many other te techniques that are that are out there. And uh, I would say that machine learning is very limited in the sense that you can only solve problems for which you can assume that the future of the system will behave as the past of the system because you have data about the past and you can then infer the future. But many times in, in many systems, this is not true. You, can ass you cannot assume that. So in those scenarios, you need other techniques like discrete event simulation. With discrete event simulation, you can optimize, of course, possibly with budget constraints uh, a system because resources are not infinite, right? And particularly the budget to 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 buy those resources or to uh, yeah. and and then there's another another uh, possibility that is very important here that is to compare what if scenarios what if a pandemic comes what if um, this service uh, gets more resources or less resources or so in those what if scenarios you can model a system that does not exist and check what would happen in that scenario. And in that sense, you can actually generate data from for a scenario that doesn't exist. And with that generated data, so the simulation models are not only, you cannot only optimize the resources, you can also generate data for other algorithms to learn and infer other things, right? And of course, in both kind of uh, possibilities, you can use real or simulated data. You can draw, uh, random arrival times, service times, this kind of stuff uh, from Poisson processors or more complex uh, random processes, or you can use your real data, the, the, the real arrivals that you received in your hospital or something like that to feed your new scenario, you know, your simulated scenario to see what would happen in that case. So for that, um, we developed Simmer as a, a tool that didn't exist before in, in R. Um, it's a general versatile framework for fast prototyping uh, with a rich and user-friendly R, uh, R API over a fast simulation core. And uh, it has a processor in the trajectory-based modeling with a rich resource control. And I highlight in here trajectory-based again and resource control because this covers the two most important things this is why this I think that Simmers is 
quite suitable for uh, simulating healthcare systems because with trajectory based means that you can model actually the trajectory that a patient uh, experiences. Uh, you model the, the, the patient journey through your system and you have a rich resource control so that you can limit how many resources of this or that you have and then uh, simulate in, in that sense. Then one important thing that I would like to highlight is that it has automatic monitoring capabilities. Uh, many, most, I don't know if uh, all, but most uh, discrete event simulation, the simulators do not have that. So you, you not only have to think about your simulation model, you have to think where are you going to collect the data that you are going to analyze later. This is not the case in, in Simmer. So there, everything is monitored automatically. You can, uh, we will see, you can get the data out from the simulator very easily afterwards. So you need to think only about your simulation model. And then, of course, you are, in, you are in R, so you have integration with R, reproducibility, analysis, visualization, anything you, you want to do. And there is quite a lot of documentation out there. We have uh, the function reference that is uh, here in, on our web page. We have 10 vignettes, uh, very complete articles about uh, many, many things related to, to many aspects of the simulator. And then uh, I would keep an eye also on the news. Uh, we, we keep updating Simmer regularly. So there are people that come to the mailing list asking for uh, new uh, things. And uh, we try to implement those uh, new features. And in the news, you will see for its release with what is the, the change log, the news about that. There is, as I said, a mailing list in Google Groups. Uh, there is this discussion panel in, in GitHub, on GitHub. And then, of course, the, if you find any, any issue, any bug report, you have the issues at, at GitHub. The main reference for this uh, simulator is this publication we did in the Journal of Statistical Software. And one thing I did is to take a look at the citations of this paper. Right now in Google Scholar, there are seven, 67 citations. And uh, as it happens, 19 of them are actually healthcare applications. So this is a very good resource if you're looking for uh, ideas of how other people are using Simmer for healthcare applications. This is a, uh, a good, a good uh, way to start. So what I did is to uh, open this group at Sotero called RSimmer, and I'm I will use this group to to collect all the citations, all these applications, and categorize them. Uh, right now, I have a group of healthcare applications where I put these nineteen uh, references so that people can easily uh, look for them. Uh, so if anyone wants to join the group at Sotero, be, uh, don't hesitate to drop me an email and uh, we can do this together. And uh, there is a package on CRAN called, called Babsim Hospital. In fact, this is one of the publications, two of the publications here uh, are related to this package uh, by uh, German researchers about hospital capacity planning using, using Zimmer. And this was uh, mainly driven by the COVID-19 pandemic. There are also tutorials out there. There's an, a very nice tutorial about, uh, it was for the NHS conference uh, 2019 by Tom Lawton. I don't know if Tom is uh, joining us today uh, about ICU patient flow modeling using Simmer. There's, there are other three tutorials, very good tutorials about cone degen, degeling. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, about uh, discrete event simulation, Simmer and healthcare uh, systems. That's also good resources for, for ideas. And I, I always like this example to present Simmer because it's you know simple enough. It's not about healthcare systems, but we can establish a, a relationship here. But I, I like it a lot because it's simple enough so that it's, it can be simulated in a, only a few lines of code and it's very easy to understand and it's complex enough so that uh, basically simulation is justified. 
So this example from 1988 is about a job shop in which jobs are allocated to the first available machine. So there are machines you know, operatives to kinds of resources. And the jobs would be our patients here. They, they, we will uh, model the journey of the job throughout the system as it needs resources to complete, right? So machines need to be, so you start here, basically the job starts here, the machine is ready. You take a machine, the, the job runs in that machine, then stops, then uh, the machine may be, may be worn out and have to be retooled or maybe serviceable and needs to be reset. And for retooling and resetting machines, you need, of course, an operative that may be a way attending other, other tasks. So we will have establishing this kind of parallelism. We have two kinds of uh, patients here, let's say. We have the jobs and the tasks, uh, other tasks that must be attended by operatives. So this is very easy to simulate. This can be simulated very easily with Simmer. Uh, let's take a look at the job trajectory. So this is the, the, the flow of the jobs, all the jobs throughout the system. So first of all, of course, we need to size a machine. Then we spend some time, time out running that, that job. And then there's a branch. When you stop, uh, there's a branch. We need to check whether the, the machine is worn. Uh, and then in that case, we need to size an operative to, to retool the machine or otherwise uh, we, we need to reset the, the machine and, and release the machine finally for other job to, to, attend, to, to join the, the queue. So very simple, the pattern is, is clear, says timeout and release. Uh, for resources, there are branches to, to take options and go this or that way. There is another uh, other tasks that need their own trajectory, of course, and this is very simple because uh, other tasks, we don't know anything about them, but that they just say an operative, uh, spend some time uh, processing it, and then release the operative. So in this way, with just a few lines of code, we model basically the, the problem at hand. Trajectories are very similar to deep prior for data manipulation, as you, you have seen in the words of Hadley Wickham, by constraining your options, you know, it simplifies how you can think about something in this case about discrete event simulation. So trajectories are recipes, lists of activities defining the lifetime of arrivals. And these activities are common functional DES blocks identified by verbs. You, uh, says, say, sees something, release something, and so on and so forth. And, and, and I would like to highlight the fixed versus dynamic parameters. You could uh, feed fixed parameters into your trajectory like that, and, and then the moment you define your trajectory, these numbers are, are fixed. So you will get an exponential random number here, and this is fixed for all, all the arrivals, and that is generally not what we want. So the power of Simmer comes when you insert functions into those parameters. Almost all parameters, except for some exceptions, most parameters in, in Simmer activities accept a function as an input. When you put a function there, it means that this is executed for each arrival when the, the, arri the particular arrival passes through these activities. So it's time uh, an arrival goes through this timeout function, it, it will draw a new random number from an exponential distribution, okay? So uh, this is where the, the, the power of SIMA really comes by using dynamic parameters in this way. So uh, coming back to our example, all these timeouts that we had, the, this check worn, this timeout running, timeout retooling, timeout resetting the machines, timeout away, this can be modeled just with a function, a function that draws random numbers from, in this case, a Poisson process, but you could use a very complex function if you like here, uh, whatever process, random process you want, or, uh, or just taking numbers from real data, whatever you want. So in, when you put an, a function there, you have uh, total freedom of uh, programming a very complex function to, for those timeouts. 
Then uh, a very brief recap of activities. We have many kinds of activities for modeling almost anything. We have uh, the activities for spending time in the system, modifying arrival properties, interaction with resources, with, source <coughs> with sources, sorry, <coughs> for looping, for branching, batching, for inter-arrival communication, for reneging, for debugging. And of course, there are many getters to retrieve to uh, ask the simulator about the particular parameters at that specific moment uh, of the system. Um, Inyaki, you have two minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, there are uh, functions to create a simulator, uh, the monitoring, and there are uh, functions to add sources of arrivals, like a generator, a data frame uh, of real data. You have uh, a function to add resources, pri priority resources. You have you can set global variables, and then you have functions to run simulation. And then the monitoring, you can get the arrivals, uh, the, the table of arrivals, the table of attributes, and the table of resources that uh, basically record all what happens in the system. And then you can analyze these tables uh, afterwards to, to get the, the measures you want. So to finish this example, we just need two generators, one of jobs, one of, of tasks. We define those generators again as a function. In this case, a Poisson process, but this could be as complex as you want. And then with one line, we get the resources and we can analyze the, the server utilization and the queue utilization. Replication and parallelization is very easy. You can just uh, apply uh, a number of times this simulation and you get uh, 10 replications of that system. If you change Laply with uh, some parallelization function, then you get the same, but uh, with a uh, in parallel fashion. You just need to ensure that you wrap your uh, simmer uh, before returning it. And then uh, this is an example of this. Best practices. There are many design patterns. This is, these are two. You can just generate, for instance, here one beep for its, uh, you're basically generating beeps and the beeps go through the trajectory or you can generate one beep here and, and roll back in a loop. I really prefer the design pattern number one, but the two patterns are available in Simmer. And um, uh, what I try, uh, I, I tend to, to uh, you know, to do with Simmer uh, is to encapsulate everything in a simulate function. I think this is the best practice. Uh, you encapsulate your simulation in a function, you define your global constants outside, then you span a grid of uh, cases, and then you all apply those cases. Uh, you apply the simulation function to those cases. I think that this is the best way to simulate with Simmer. There are extensions, very briefly. Um, there are a simmer plot extension so that you can easily plot uh, resources. You can plot your trajectories to see if they're, uh, they're doing what you're expecting. Uh, there is a simmer bricks uh, packeting on CRAN with uh, patterns of activities that may not be so easily implemented, like a delayed release or a parallel uh, task. And there are other extensions in, 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 on GitHub, like Simmer Optim, that, that is parameter optimization functions for Simmer, that is uh, right now dormant. But if anyone wants to try it and, and, and help with it, we'll be happy. So as a summary, this is a generic the powerful processor in this creative and simulation for R, combines a robust, fast, and sim simulation curve with a rich and flexible API. There is a broad set of activities, which are the basic building blocks here. And these activities are chained into trajectory that are the common path for processes in, in our case would be of patients to the system. There is automatic monitoring with focus on modeling and its integration with the other R tools. So that's all, thank you and, and happy Simmer. Inyaki, thank you very much indeed. There's lots of discussion and chat going on while you were speaking and uh, uh, no doubt. I think uh, I should point out that uh, when Tom Lawton did his work on um, 
capacity modeling in hospitals. He actually reached out to Inyaki for a lot of help and support. So um, so that's also kind of much appreciated, really. Thank you, Inyaki. We'll, we will let, let you go. Uh, and um, I think there are, let me just see. Um, yeah, um, so so um, th th there's questions about slides. We'll, we'll pick that up later. I'm, I'm sure everybody's happy to share and re record things anyways. Okay, In Inyaki, thank you so much. I'm going to move on to Sam, if I may, thank please. You. So our, our next speaker is Sam Hollings, who's going to talk to, about, uh, talk to us about um, RAP. Um, take it away, Sam. <laughs> hey there, yeah, cool. I'm just trying to figure out how to share. Here we are, yeah, cool, so. Awesome. Hopefully that's uh, working as it should do. Like, I'm Sam Hollings from NH Digital. Um, I'm a principal data scientist. It's a bit of a different talk than the previous one, but hopefully a good different. It's more sort of a strategic, I guess. Uh, and it, I'll talk about how we rolled out RAP across our analytical function. So first, it's good to lay out what, what is RAP, uh, Reproducible Analytical Pipelines. And I won't spend loads of time on this because um, you can spend loads of time on it. And instead, I think it's more important to talk about the stuff that I'll spend the rest of the thing talking about. But um, in short, it's about taking the most relevant bits of software development good practice and making it relevant and usable by analysts. That's my take on it. And here's how we've sort of, we've, we've, we've defined it in, the, in these levels. So baseline wrap means people are using an open source language, Python, R or SQL, the code's version controlled so using Git and it's peer reviewed. You know, people publish the code publicly and the publication should link back to the code so people can see what, what, what made it. And this gives you loads of benefits. Um, and this is the priority for us so far. Uh, also, it really sets you up nicely for silver level wrap, which is really about making, you know, refactoring this baseline and making it more robust and more reusable fully automating outputs, codes well organized, modular, reusable, well documented, tested, dependency management. And then finally you get gold where basically you get into analysis as a software. So it's fully packaged, environment managed, CACD scheduled, changes clear signposted. You can find out loads more about this in these links below or to the side or wherever it is like, and uh, definitely check out the government analysis uh, function wrap strategy and our own edge digital wrap community have practiced loads of information on all these. However, you know, we all think wrap's amazing. Um, and, uh, but how do you roll it out in a business? So, you know, wrap offers transparency, utility through sharing code publicly, open source languages, quality and speed because you're automating the manual steps and resilience to change because, you know, it's open source, it's more possible, you can use it on other platforms. So you're training a few analysts, you know, you've built some pipelines. But how do we train everyone else in the business? You know, and how do we do all these other pipelines? Um, so I'm going to talk to you about how we made a central rap squad to get rap going. Um, how important it is to monitor the progress of rap on the big scale in, in the business. How it's also crucial that the that, that effort is put into promoting rap up and down the business. Um, and all of this will hopefully lead to analysts taking more ownership of rap and then ultimately wrap becoming self-propagating within the business. Um, okay, so <laughs> the challenge of wrap and edge digital. So uh, the role of energy digital, one of our roles is to gather and store patient data, to process it to make publications, which describe the state of the health service, and ultimately for those to be used to inform policymakers and the public to improve the NHS and care systems. And in doing this, we've got quite a complicated tech stack um, where we use R, Python, Excel, SAS, SQL, SSRS, SSIS, S3 Bucket, SQL Service. We use everything basically. Um, and they're all running concurrently. And you know, there's quite a lot of manual steps linking these things together. And at the moment, many of our analysts don't know Python or Git. Like, and they're also just really busy. So, and we also have like 140 publications and 200 analysts. So um, trying to expect our analysts to solve all of this and figure it out is, is, you know, it's very difficult for them because uh, they don't have the holistic view. And that's why that we decided to make this central wrap squad that would see the whole picture from above and hopefully then try and figure it out. Like, 
So yeah, a squad of the yeah, scientists was put together and set up to act as our first rap champions. And they had a number of roles. So to define rap, which means to break it down into levels like baseline, silver and gold, um, to make it achievable. So people don't think, whoa, that's hard. It's impossible for me. They can, they can achieve baseline. So create, maintain and create rap resources. So there's lots of guidance on the internet. But it was really important that we made specific guidance, like very talking about our exact systems and the exact problems we have here. And then uh, championing RAP in the organization. So going out to teams, selling the benefits of RAP, you know, making it real for them and publicizing those that have already done it, sharing their great work and really sort of celebrating them. Training people. So we do a lot of training. We guide people down the path of RAP, like, and hopefully, help at least some of them become rap champions themselves so they can then start spreading the good word and yeah to be a point of support because you know in any change program people have questions and they need someone to go to for help and for answers and you know that's what we are so yeah the rap squad was going out help we we helped some teams and publications to to do rap that was great um we also had some teams doing it themselves, you know, looking at our resources or other resources and just doing rap on their own, which is wonderful. And then we had a lot of teams doing this and, uh, you know, we were almost the victim of our own success. And so we needed a way of tracking what was actually going on so we could, we could have the big picture. And, and so we got our lead analyst to fill out um, an Excel spreadsheet, basically, which we call our rap tracker uh, for all our publications. So we could know what the maturity level was of those publications. So how far through they'd got baseline, silver, gold, which bits they were stuck on and any benefits they'd accrued. So time saved, burden reduced or whatever. And this was, it sounds really obvious, but you know, like um, it, it really made the progress of the different teams and publications a lot clearer and crucially allowed us to really identify where help was needed. Promoting RAP. Like, so, you know, we knew that we knew the big picture, but not everyone else did. So basically we just had a massive publicity campaign. We had weekly drop-in sessions where people could come and ask us about anything. And we pushed those, you know, a lot to try and get people to come along. Monthly seminars where we got speakers to come in and talk about how they'd done rap or cool tech stuff or like ways of, you know, you're using the technology that we have. Um, we set up a, a slot on a, our directorate wide briefing to talk about the rap work in the business at a high level so that everyone can access it, you know, even right at the top of the business. And we even set up a workshop with our new cohort of graduates on the second week of them being here. So we could tell them about rap and have them solving problems and thinking about efficiency and, and making things reusable. Basically, any chance we got, we've been selling rap, like always be closing, like always be selling it. And um, yeah, we really focused on the benefits of RAP. So to the organization, but also to individuals, making it clear to them how this helps them and linking it to their work, making it relevant and also making it a solution to their problems rather than just pushing some technology that they don't see what the benefit of it is. The Gold Day review has been really helpful because it's brought our RAP into the conversation. Um, but it's also been important that we've aimed our communication at all levels because a lot of the stuff online is is focused at analysts, you know, how do I use Git? How do I use PySpark or something like that? Like, and uh, whereas we've been trying to communicate with managers, heads of department, directors, to make sure everybody knows that rap is something we all have to own and all have to think about. So leading on from this, like people can sometimes feel rap is something done for them or to them by experts. Well, it's something we really need to change that opinion for this to really get going. So we worked with analysts to understand when we worked with the analysts to help them build the pipelines, we worked, we made sure they understood how to make the pipelines, not, 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 not just that we made it for them, but also how to own the code base and how to use Git and all the rest of it, like, um, and how to review and learn from each other and not just us. Like, that was a crucial part of the training. We also worked with the senior analysts, um, which was really important to make sure that they knew their part in all of this and that they could then strategize how to continue the ratification of their pipelines and to plan how to spread the knowledge that's been taught to them and their team 
to the rest of their area. I mean, this is an ongoing process, but you know, the analysts have started to take more ownership and, and importantly, they've started to tell us what they need. Because beforehand we were having to dig and, and ask them, whereas now they'll come to us and say, okay, we need this because they're taking ownership of it. And one of the cool things, um, our director had an idea where he made a competition that the first code to publish got like a little prize. It was some like chocolate or something like, and this actually really motivated them. And the analysts got really competitive about who could publish their code first and get, you know, down the levels of rap. So fun stuff like that can really help people get some ownership of it. Um, yeah, and all this has been leading towards making rap self-propagating. So rap cannot be sustained by the work of a few heroes. Like, and by this, I mean, we go out and train people and then those people need support and, and they need to be, you know, continue. The, the central rap squad are the rap champions. They're, they should be there to support others to learn, not to make pipelines. And if, because if they were to manage every rap project and to basically do it themselves, it might take six years to do all of our pipelines, which is just too long. So we've really promoted an expectation amongst those trained that they will, well, one, make more rap pipelines and two, pass on the skills and knowledge to others. Um, but, you know, I recognize this is really difficult given BAU pressures because people are busy. They've got a lot of stuff to do. So it also helps that you really focus on prioritizing burden reduction. That's really, really crucial to free up people's time to allow them to do all this stuff. Sam, one more minute, please. Cool. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Yeah, done. <laughs> so our, our analytical tribes are. Um, so how's it going? Our, our analytical tribes are engaged and actively planning how they will wrap out their pipelines, and reuse what's been made. The senior leadership take wrap seriously, which is really great. Our analysts feel valued and understand the benefit of wrap. We've got seven active publications published, thirty-one more on the way. About two thirds of our pipelines are written in some form of open source code. We've got you know. Rap skills sprinkled across the, the organization and teams are training each other. And we've got loads of great guidance that we publish on the internet that you can go check out. And here's a little picture of our uh, page. So yeah, definitely have a look. And I just want to say thank you to all the, the members of the Rap Squad, past and present, because this is their work. They did all this. And yeah, it's just incredible. So thanks. <laughs> um, that's great. Thank you. I, there's been lots of chat on uh, about this and also uh, obviously a round of applause I really think we would we're delighted by the things you've said and the embracing of rap is a common aim now a common purpose across uh, the entire uh, health and care system so we um, finding a way to interact more with you guys and getting your insight today has made a really good uh, good start with that so I'm sure there'll be lots of follow-up and interest on this so thank you very much Sam awesome wonderful Great, thank you. Without further ado, I'll hand over to Tom. So, Tom, if you can take the floor, please, on SBC Reporter. Thank you. Of course. Hi, everyone. Hopefully you can see some slides there as they popped up. Um, to introduce myself, I'm Tom Smith. I'm the um, well, one of the insight managers. Um, I work in family health at Nottingham University Hospitals. Um, and I'm going to introduce to you a package that I've written called SBC Reporter. Um, it's loosely based on some code that that's, I've actually been using in, in house for about a year now. But finally, this conference has given me the excuse to package it up properly uh, and make it available for others. So what is the SPC reporter package? Um, in a nutshell, it's a simple way um, for analysts to add value to performance reporting using statistical process control or SPC. Um, it helps analysts sort signal from noise and hopefully it'll help analysts ensure their leadership are talking about signals that matter the most and, and not about any of the noise. Um, the output is an HTML report um, supported, uh, sort of rendered through our markdown. Um, the code up front is open source already, so there's a link there to my um, GitHub account where the code is living. Um, it's inspired heavily by the NHS England Making Data Count program, which is led by, by Sam Riley. It uses NHSR plot the dots as a key kind of um, dependency for, for doing all of the SPC calculations. But the, fundamentally, the aim is to save everyone time. Um, and it certainly saved us time. There's a little bit about that later on. Um, 
before I waffle on for too much longer, you really want to see the output. So the, the next slide is an overview of, of the output. Um, it's a little screen recording, which hopefully will start moving. Um, yeah, so this is the, the report as it as it looks as a title subtitles some report references um date time stamps for when it's created it's a it's an opinionated package um it, it forces you to put some of this stuff in because i think that having some of this stuff is, is a good thing um the measures that it reports on are down here and you can group them up into different domains or areas or wards or divisions um, and then each metric that it reports uh, is, a, is a row and you can see we've got the making data count variation assurance and some data quality icons against each row um, in line with the making data count teaching if um, any of them are throwing exceptions and looking like they are um, have special cause like this one for example you can click on it and it will expand out into a, an spc chart so you've effectively got a rolled up view um, and also the ability to click in and look in more detail into the report. And that's what the HTML uh, sort of dynamic nature of HTML gives us. At the bottom of the document, you've got um, a little key where people can remind themselves what the icons mean. Um, that's embedded within each report that generates. And then you've got, again, a, another little report reference and then um, an email address for yourself as the author so that people can ask questions. So that's the um, outline of the of the, the package. Um, why did I need to make it? Well, I needed. To, um, I found myself in a position where I needed to scan a lot of uh, metrics and to find signal in a lot of metrics and potentially in a lot of noise. Um, I wanted to be able to standardise the reporting methodology so that the output was common, so that we kind of had, uh, you know, common commonality of output and 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 good quality output that people could de depend on. I also needed to reduce lead time going from data to output um, and that, you know this package has enabled that to happen it's gone from days to, to seconds really and um, Sam's just been talking about wrap but it's a step towards reproducible analytical, analytical pipelines it's sort of the last step if you like the delivery of the end result it's one option to be able to deliver analytical output to, to consumers um, machines do a great job of repetitive work and I wanted to be able to save time for, for analysts to, to do the deeper work. So this slide is a, a little overview of, of how to use the package. Fundamentally, there, there are three data frames that go in at, on the left hand side. Um, those then uh, you call a function called make data bundle, which, which bundles them up into a, and, and gives a data bundle output. You then put that data bundle into another function called make report. And when that's run, out pops your HTML report. In code, it looks like this. So again, you've just got three arguments going into the data, uh, the make data bundle function, and then you pass that uh, result into the make report, and that's it. The three data frames that um, go in are, are, are these ones, and I'm gonna go through, um, there's a bit more detail in, in the slides that are coming up. So we've got measure data. So this is your numbers, you know, month to month or week to week, what are your numbers for each metric? We've got some report config. So this defines what appears on your report. Um, and then we've got some measure config. So this is, uh, this I'll go through in a bit more detail, but it's fundamentally the, the things that uh, matter for the SPC calculations. So picking those off one at a time, um, the measure data is your numbers. It's the data that you want to plot and it's arranged in a wide format. Um, and that's deliberate decision. Um, to enable easy manual data collection. So my assumption, my working assumption is that most people in most places are going to have some element of manual data collection for some of their reporting. Um, and this uh, arrangement means that you can read the tables that people are completing manually directly in um, without too much um, messing about really. The next data frame is the report config. So as I've mentioned, this is the items that you want on your report. They will appear in the order that you define in this data frame, um, and they'll they'll appear under the headings or what I've called domains that you that you uh, define on this um, data frame. So this one's got domain one, area two, and zone three, but those are probably going to be wards or divisions or something. You can also give it an aggregation level. So in the case that you've provided data for both aggregations, say weekly and monthly data, but you only want one of them, you, that's where you define it. You can pull one of them or the other onto the report or both if you need them. 
Um, the final data frame is um, the measure config. So this is all of your configuration that's relevant for each uh, metric. It quite rarely changes. You're probably going to end up with kind of one config file for your whole specialty, your department or your division. And it's where we define things like the data source, who owns the measure, which direction represents improvement. So is up good or is down good? What's the target and who set the target? Things like that. So as I've mentioned, you take those three data frames, you pass them in to the make data bundle function. Um, and that function reads and transforms the files. It does all the SPC calculations with the help of the plot the dots package. It creates the ggplot chart objects, and it does a little bit of string processing for convenience uh, for kind of report authoring later. Um, and ne the next slide gives you a little bit of an overview of what that data bundle looks like. So you can see things like uh, the data source, who the data owner is, the unit of measure. These are the things that have come out of the measure config file. Um, but you, you've also down here, uh, I can't use my mouse, but down here you've got um, a nested chart object and a nested chart data as well from the SPC calculations. So the next step is you pass that into the make report function, which makes your report. Um, this is an opinionated package. So it's it, there are six arguments that are compulsory. One is the data bundle. Um, and then the, the, the other five are things like title and the report reference, your data cutoff time. So when are you reporting to? Is it the end of last week, the end of the week before, the end of last month? Um, and also, we, I believe we need to be contactable. So, um, you know, a mandatory argument is your, you know, your name and your email address so that people can get in touch if they spot problems. So you pop those into the make report function. Um, and you should get a report. So now I've got a little demo from start to finish in real time. This particular one, we've added a few optional arguments. We've got um, a logo, which we've added, which, uh, which is here. We've got um, a sort of a, a department caption. I've also changed the, the what we've called the paper color, the background color. So let's just run through that. So here we are running the code. I've blurred the console just for file names, but you can see it chugging along. rendering the R Markdown output now. And here's the resulting report. So it's an NHSR community report. <laughs> it's got the same metrics as we had before, but you can see um, that's, what it, that, that's what it produces. So from start to finish, um, hopefully you can see that that's dramatically shortened the lead time to go from kind of raw material into something that can be consumed. Oh, I've got a few thumbs up, brilliant. Glad people like it. <laughs> There are more advanced use cases that you can use. So this is a this is a silly example where I'm going to be adding kind of red, amber, green paper colours because we need to add red, amber, green back into our lives somehow now that uh, making data count has taken it all away. Um, but that's a trivial example. Probably what you'd aim to do with something like that is create a suite of reports. Um, so in this example, we've got kind of all of our reports bundled up here into kind of a, a set of configuration options. This particular one, we're just changing the paper color from red to yellow to green. And then we can use the per package to walk through all of those reports and make them. So the next slide, not particularly interesting slide, but again, it's in real time. So that's the red report that's just popped out. Um, and while I, while I um, chat away here, hopefully it's working on the next one. There's the amber report that's just popped out. Um, and then there'll be a green one along in a minute. Obviously, you're not going to want to change report colors. You're probably going to be feeding different data to these um, and um, you know different titles, different owners, and different metric sets. But the concept is you can map map over the report generating function to to really save yourself time if you get the config set up. So in summary, the, there's the end-to-end -end code. We we pass three um, data frames into a make data bundle. Um, function, pass that into our make report function, and then out pops a report. Um, the source code is there. Um, please do get in touch with any questions, and of course, issues and PR requests more than welcome. Um, before I close, though, I just wanted to go on and talk about a couple of open source bits in the NHS, um, the, the so what of open source. So we, we need to acknowledge that there are some challenges to working openly in the NHS. And um, one way of doing that, I just want to propose, is to talk about financial value that our code has. Um, and the next slide is a simplistic attempt to, to value this package. So let's go and do that. Um, so far, this package has been used, like I say, for about a year. It's saved 
in my estimation, the small part of the division that, that it's used in about one week a month, which at band seven equates to approximately £10,000 a year just in the use case that it's already implemented in. My division, my trust has about six divisions in it. So let's roll that up and say, if it was applied in a small part of each of those six divisions, you'd be talking about £60,000 a year. Um, and let's roll that up even further and say that, let's say 25% of the trusts in the, in the country adopt this package or something like it. There's a potential value there to the NHS of £3.3 .3 million pounds annually. Um, it's a small number in context, but it's also a small amount of code. So it's about 120 hours of code. Uh, which basically means that we've got about £27,000 of value created per hour of development time on this code. Um, and that's, that's time that, that, that pays us back over, over and over again. It, it recurs every year. Um, that can only happen if the code's shared. Um, and it can also only happen if people are able to, to use shared code um, and supported to do so by their IT policies. So anyway, I just wanted to put that out there as a potential... Uh, uh, new way of considering the, the value of our code, which hopefully might, might, might help to get a little bit of attention on, onto what we're trying to do. Um, in summary, code's valuable. Let's write more of it. Let's share more of it. Um, let's try and demystify and, and capture the value of open source. Um, and the parting sort of question there is, you know, how can you, in, in your role, um, help reduce friction and help to say yes to open source in NHS? Um, and so that's the end of the presentation. Um, I know I've rattled through that at a fair old pace, but if there are any questions, if we've got time for any now, we could take some now, um, or if there are any um, later, I'll be around on the Slack as I normally am. So thank you. Tom, uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, Tom, just a personal thanks really. Not only did you agree to do a lightning talk, but you've, you've put in actually two really big ideas in your lightning talk. One, obviously the SPC reporter, but the, the financial value um, of open source solutions, um, I really, I, I, I mean, I'm sure this will be something that people will, uh, will kind of take on board because um, uh, the, the dumbest question I find or, uh, or hardest to ask, answer also is uh, what's the business case? <laughs> so uh, I think, uh, anyways, feel free to say a little bit more about that, Tom. And if there are other questions, I will field them. So just expand a bit more on your thinking on the financial value and how you you came to that uh, um, uh, kind of junction and um, and your thought process, really. Sure. Yeah. So I suppose part of it is that I'm relatively new to the NHS. I came from um, manufacturing environments where um, there are business cases constantly around investment decisions and, and trading off, you know, current value against future value. Um, and, and part of that is, you know, tangible assets. You know, if you're buy, building machine, you're building machine. But, but things like code do have assets, um, asset value as well. Um, and obviously, if you're a software house, almost all of the work that you're doing, all of the person hours that are being put into uh, the business, manifest themselves as kind of intangible benefit in terms of code. So that's really where it came from. It, it came from that, that thinking way. Um, and hopefully it, it, it could help us to um, just, you know, it's just one more little um, um, item in the armory, I suppose, in terms of moving, moving the conversation on and, and trying to reduce friction for the way we want to work. Great, Tom. Uh, Tom is very active on Slack and again encouraging everybody to join Slack as well. Uh, a big thank you to all our speakers, all our delegates. Can I just have a round of applause for everybody? We'll have a break now. We'll be back around 10 past one and our, our, and our speakers will start at quarter past one. So see you all very soon. Thank you very much indeed.
Hello everyone and welcome back to um, the second portion of the uh, online talks for the NHS Heart Conference today. So I hope you all had a nice break and if you're joining us uh, for the afternoon session then uh, I can assure you that uh, we've got some really interesting talks. We've had some really interesting ones already and um, just for my speakers um, I will call, I'll just give you a nudge at two minutes before your time's up. Um, it's just so that we can keep we can keep to time and it's just a reminder really um so thank you everybody for joining uh we're due to start in a in a minute or so so i will just hang on in case some people are, are joining exactly uh, on time but uh our first speaker uh is going to be R R rory so rory when i do hand over to you please uh, introduce yourself and then uh take your 15 minutes uh for the talk uh, in the meantime, if anybody has any questions during the session, if you can post them into the Q&A uh, icon uh, through your Zoom uh, interface, so questions in there, please, uh, and I'll do my best to um, to address those with the uh, with the speaker. Uh, otherwise, colleagues can make comments um, and contributions through the chat in the usual way. So uh, without any, uh, so people have asked if things are recorded and so on. Yes, all the sessions will be recorded and will be posted to YouTube as soon as possible. So um, uh, that that should be kind of within 48 hours of of uh, uh, of the session. Great. Uh, so without further ado, can I welcome Rory? Rory, would you please take the floor? Thank you. Thanks, Mohammed. Um, share this. Uh sure I have this. Okay, so I hope everybody can see uh, my slides okay. Um, my name is Rory Quinn. I'm a data analyst uh, working for the Health Service Executive in Ireland, uh, specifically with the Clinical Directorate of the National Ambulance Service. And I learned about this conference through the NHS uh, our, uh, community Twitter channel, which is a really uh, useful fit place for finding open source resources of use to um, data analysts working in healthcare settings. Um, I was going to talk a little bit today about a, a, a project I did about, I suppose, about 18 months ago now, um, where I used R for natural language, uh, some natural language processing tasks. Um, I should say I'm the only um, analyst working in the clinical directorate of the National Ambulance Service, um, and I'm very much learning as I go along. Um, I'd be really interested in networking with um, other analysts doing similar type of work, um, either in the HSE or NHS. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background about the uh, the service itself. Hang on a second now, I'm just having some problems here <laughs> moving forward. Yeah, here we go. Uh, so the uh, we're, we're a statutory provider of emergency medical services in the Republic of Ireland, so we're the sole statutory provider of those services outside of Dublin City and County. And then within Dublin, um, both, our, both NAS and Dublin Fire Brigade provide those uh, services. And we deal with approximately 300,000 calls per year, probably probably more than that now. It's, it's going up all the time. Um, so our practitioners, when they go out to a call, they have these tough book tablets so they can create electronic patient uh, care records so they can essentially document the care that they provide um, on these tablets, stored in a database, and then goes through an ETL process where it's uploaded into a data warehouse where it can be queried and extracted for analysis. Um, I know there's a number of um, ambulance services in the UK use the same um, practice for documenting their care. Um, so. One of the fields that the practitioner has to fill out when completing their electronic patient care report is the diagnostic fields. So they need to assign both a categorical, uh, so th they're given a selection of categories which they can choose, things like neurological, cardiac, medical, so on. And then beneath that, there are nested menus where they can pick a specific item. And those are the fields that I use as an analyst typically when identifying episodes of care to including KPIs and reports, they'd be the first fields I go to. So it's important from a data quality point of view that the diagnosis is recorded accurately. So back in 2020, you may not be able to see that frequency distribution graph too well, but essentially what I did was I uh, took a sample of about 200,000 records and looked at the frequency with which um, diagnostic items were assigned to patients. And you can see there that very much certain items are overused. So anyone familiar with the 
Pareto principle might not be too surprised with that. It's basically a small number of cases or a small number of diagnosis items are going to are going to be used for a large number of cases. But unfortunately, the ones that are overused tend to be the least informative ones. So if you look at the very top one there, you may not be able to see it, but it's the medical other category. 25% of all our patients were given a diagnosis of medical and then a further diagnosis of other, which is not really very informative for us when we're trying to come and analyze that data. It means like if we need to identify, say, all uh, stroke cases, um, for example, and they haven't been coded correctly, it just makes it much more difficult to do. Um, so the goal of this analysis that I did was essentially to uh, analyze the free text in the working. So when they're assigning a, a diagnosis to the patient, there is also an option for them to record a note along with the diagnosis. So where that that's just literally, they just type it in. So it's just free text, just a character string. Um, so the idea was to try and use that when it was available, because it's not available in all records, to try and understand why all these patients are being assigned these less informative uh, diagnoses. So essentially, that's a, uh, it's a clustering task. So we're trying to find groups of records that are similar to one another, but different to other groups. And hopefully then the words that characterize those groups can tell us a little bit about what um, the notes relating to that person's diagnosis were. So for example, is is it just the wrong item has been assigned or is it that there are items missing from the menus that maybe we should think about adding in? Um, so typically we'll use um, natural, langu natural language processing algorithms to do that. Um, and they often rely on word frequency or word position to try and extract structure from the unstructured text data. So anyone that works with the uh, free text medical data will know it's quite messy. Um, so it needs to be pre-processed before running those because obviously if you've the same word spelled a hundred different ways, the algorithm is going to think that's a hundred different words rather than the same word. And you want to know, you want it to recognize that it's the same word. Um, so the first thing was to create a data set of cases with a working diagnosis of other, and then that had text in the working diagnosis details field. And then we can import that into R as a data frame. Um, we have a unique case identifier. We have the category of diagnosis they were assigned and then a column containing the textual data. So as I said, I very much learning as I go along. So I found that when I was trying to tokenize the textual data, it wasn't tokenizing it, just splitting it into individual units or words um, called tokens. So it wasn't really tokenizing properly um, because of the acronyms and abbreviations. It depends on the, it depends on the package. I, mean, I was using tidy text um, it depends on the package you're using as to exactly how it tokenizes um, your your data, but um, I found it was more useful to use the G sub command to basically replace uh, text strings with these medical terms um, and then tokenize it after that so that it, it split properly into words. So when that was done, then uh, I had to run that list of words. So I had a, a list of words, thousands and thousands of words that made up the whole uh, corpus of documents. And you run this through a dictionary. So the, the one that was available when I was using, when I was doing this analysis is the Hunspell package. Um, I actually augmented that with a medical dictionary. So there are some good open source medical dictionaries. There's a GitHub site, Glutanimate. They have a, a, an open source medical dictionary there that's really available to use. And you can augment the standard R dictionary with that. So in R Studio, you can, it says you can do it using tools, global options, and then um, loading custom dictionaries. I found that I couldn't get it to work that way. I had to actually go into the navigate to the dictionaries folder and add it in there. So it's all kind of a trial and error process. Um, but essentially what it does when you run, run it through those uh, dictionary packages, um, it'll return a vector of words which are not in the dictionary. So typically these will be misspellings. Um, and you can also get it to suggest replacement words. So it can basically use as an algorithm to decide what word in the dictionary most closely matches the unrecognized word. The only issue here is these need to be manually checked. So I, when I was finished um, this pre-processing and I had created my list of words that were not in the dictionary, there was about 14,000 of them. So I needed to then go through all those um, and either accept the select the recommended um, correction or uh, deleted and input what 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 the correction should be, and then you use a text matching um, package to basically replace all instances of strings 
and that have been identified as not being in the dictionary with the correction that you have supplied. And um, the good thing about that is you only need to do it once. It took a long time, it took me about a week to do it, um, just going through word after word. Um, but it's um, once you have that done, it saves a lot of time because you can just reuse that list again and again when you're pre-processing future data. Um, so once you have your pre-processing done then, um, and there's other things you can do in pre-processing, you can stem the words. Um, you may or may not want to try and analyze um, numbers, numeric data, if it's mixed in with the text data. Um, but once that's done and you wanna start analyzing your data, so we wanna find groups of documents that are similar to one another. Um, there's various different options for using this. Um, topic modeling is the one I chose. Um, a particular difficulty with this data set is that it was extremely short. So some of the um, notes would just be a couple of words and the longest would maybe be three or four sentences. So um, it doesn't really make sense to assume that each document can be comprised of multiple topics. Each document is likely just to refer to one document at working diag or a diagnosis in this case. Um, and, uh, but I did find a type of topic modeling that's particularly useful with short um, documents and that's by term topic modeling. It's been used a lot to analyze Twitter data actually, um, but it, it can be used with any data where the, in the, the length of the individual documents is short, but you have a lot of documents. Um, one thing you need to do is you need to specify in advance the number of topics or data set contains, and that can be more of an art than a science. Sometimes you just need to run it, for, run the algorithm for different numbers of topics and see which ones are the most interpretable. You can also, Last time I used this package, it didn't have these exclusivity functions and semantic coherence functions in the package itself, but on the issues um, site for by term topic modeling package on GitHub, it does give functions that you can, you can essentially use the code to calculate an exclusivity function and semantic coherence function. And that'll tell you which, of, which number of topics is more suitable for the data set you're analyzing. So just a summary there is just uh, pre-processing the data I said use G sub functions to lengthen acronyms and abbreviations, uh, tokenize the words. Um, you have to do some manual processing then. And then um, once the manual processing is done, you can replace all words on your, on your list with the correct version. Um, further processing might be required. And then once you've standardized the text data and processed it, you can pre-process it, you can run the national language processing algorithms. Um, there's some code there. Um, ones for Huntspell. So um, essentially it's uh, checking the checking the, the the word list. It's um, returning a vector of words that aren't in the dictionary, it's then suggesting replacements for those words. And then it suggests them in a list. So you have to unlist that, bind it, and then write it to a CSV or an Excel file. And that's your word list then that has to be manually checked. But so it only needs to be done once. And then you can reuse that word list again and again. And that's just some code for BTM there. It's quite uh, straightforward to use. Um, it's quite a straightforward package to use. The vignette is, is pretty good for it. Um, so some of the results we found, well, nice to see patient at the center. That's just a, a word cloud there. It's nice to see patient at the center of that since patients are at the center of everything we do. Um, these are um, just uh, word frequency lists as well. Um, this is where I calculated the term frequency inverse document frequency. So that kind of shows you which words are most important um, to each category. So each of these categories is a category with um, an item, uh, a diagnosis item of other. Um, you can see kind of which are the most important. So um, in medical there, for example, there are some items it's probably difficult to see maybe, but there are some items there that actually correspond to existing diagnosis cellulitis, for example. So we would want to be kind of finding out why there are a group of records given a diagnosis of medical other where the practitioner has indicated cellulitis was a, a problem, uh, given that there's already an, an item there for cellulitis. Like why didn't they choose that? Um, and you can do that for the different categories to see um, what type of words are most important. I think this is just the top 10 um, words in each category based on term frequency, inverse document frequency. Another thing you can do is you can correlate the categories. So it, this is just an example. All the categories here look pretty similar to one another, apart from maybe respiratory and obstetrics, which I suppose 
would be a bit different to the others but obviously at the end of the day they're all describing diagnosis so um you would expect them to be similar uh this is uh words that tend to typically co-occur together um so you can you you can kind of go through that in more detail um, after you've done your analysis. This was the results of the topic modeling I did. So I got, I think, how many is there there? About 12 um, topics from this particular analysis, which I think there was 80,000 records in the analysis that, um, that I did. Um, and these were all in the medical other category. Uh, it is difficult to see there, but the words, uh, describing each topic. So you could summarize them in terms of 12 different topics. So we found one um, to do with infection, one to do with pain, particularly pain in, in um, the lower body, um, one to do with interfacility transfers, which is interesting because they shouldn't really be there. You should have been taken out beforehand. Uh, one to do with COVID. This was during COVID. So, and again, they should have been coded separately. Um, one to do with behavioral problems or um, uh, overdose. Um, there was one to do with road traffic collision where the patient had suffered a head injury, uh, one to do with vitals measurements, one to do with falls, and then some other ones, ones to do with pediatric patients also. Um, so it's just to give us an idea of what um, cases are being put into um, the less informative diagnostic categories. So some of the implications, I suppose, is just to help us understand which conditions receive a diagnosis of other instead of a more descriptive diagnose, diagnosis, understanding why certain diagnosis or items are overused. We might want to do some focus groups with our practitioners to try and get a better understanding of that. It also might indicate gaps in the current menu options. So definitely the menu options in the tool that we use to record the electronic patient care reports could be optimized better. Um, might want to look at providing some training for our practitioners in the use of EPCR so that um, they typically get training at the beginning of their career in using it, but they could be working for years and may not get any other training. So be a good idea maybe to have some refresher for them, um, refresher training for them. That's kind of a very quick overview of that particular project. As I said, I'm very much learning as I go along. I'd be really interested in uh, uh, networking with any uh, data analysts doing similar type of work um, in the HSE or NHS. And so thanks very much, everybody, for listening. Rory, thank you very much indeed. And uh, thank you for reaching out to us as well. And of course, I'm sure there'll be lots of people interested. Uh, Rory, I I'm just a bit curious. Uh, how long did you go from, from kind of uh, being familiar with a little bit about R to actually being able to do uh, text analysis of practitioner notes? Um, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it took a while. I was doing various different um, projects in natural language processing. Um, it took a while, but I mean, it's just basically try and find a tutorial on a particular aspect that you want to try and implement yourself and then learn from that. And it's, it's just really learning as you go along. We're going to make lots of mistakes and just try and um, just try and learn. Like there's so, so much resources out there. And like I said, the, um, the NHS are community Twitter channel is great, great place for finding resources I find of use. Um, so there's, there's plenty of resources. So it's just really, and it, once you have the, you have the data, so it's just, um, you know, trying to apply those resources to solve a particular problem that you business problem or um, analytics problem that you that you face. That's great, Rory. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so I'm now going to move us to our next speaker, who's Jessica Pang. Um, Jessica is unfortunately unable to be with us, but has kindly recorded um, uh, 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 her talks by video. So if I hand over to our colleagues from WTV to switch to Jessica's talk, please. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the conference so far today. Uh, I'm unable to be there, unfortunately. So I've recorded a couple of videos in place of a virtual in-person presentation. Um, hopefully there'll be no issues and it will run really smoothly, but we'll see what happens. And I'm sure everyone will be great at troubleshooting <laughs> if anything goes wrong. Um, my name is Jessica Pang. I'm an analyst in Improvement Cymru in Public Health Wales, and I've worked there for about eight years. This is my first presentation today. I've got another one directly afterwards and both are to do with kind of adapt 
adapting previous work. But this one is to do with adapting your own work and the next is about editing other people's work. Uh, that's the kind of overarching theme of the presentations I'm doing today, uh, adaptation of previous stuff. Um, so moving forward, <laughs> I've put a bit of a, a background to the adaptation I made, which is adapting a dashboard to work with an uploaded file in R Shiny. So the original dashboard, this is the original dashboard, which I've presented in a couple of places before. It's something fed by an static Excel document that's updated by the analytics team in Improvement Cymru. Um, so fed with a workbook that contains data from different hospitals in Wales. Uh, that data is secondary purpose data uh, from audit uh, collected on emergency lapotomies, uh, those being kind of big abdominal surgeries. It's called the National Emergency Lapotomy Audit. Um, the project that was related to this dashboard was shut down during COVID, but the audit data still exists. And so in less busy periods of time, I've been trying to edit it to make it possible to submit your own update of data rather than sending your data through to our team and requiring an upload from us uh, so that work can continue and the measures can be looked at. Um, and that means that there's not interaction with us uh, and so we're not acting as a, a middleman and potentially a blocker and also to allow um, less kind of excessive extra analysis from the teams in the hospitals that collect this data uh, in order to allow them to make up to date kind of improvements whenever they want to and monitor any changes from them. Um, so it felt like it would be a simple task uh, to to do this so to um, stop us uploading files and instead to have people upload their own directly into the application. Um, but it wasn't a really easy task. It wasn't too difficult, but it wasn't really easy either. Anyone who's used Shiny or Shiny before knows that it can be really difficult to untangle the different parts of the UI and the server. And so I got lost a couple of times just trying to research what I should be doing. <laughs> um, there's also loads of different solutions for uh, the same problem. So it, you can get into a little bit of a rabbit hole with that. Um, anyway, those who don't know our Shiny, I just want to make it a little bit more accessible as a presentation by describing uh, how this is working and the things that are tricky about um, changing in our shiny application and just building them in general um, the our shiny applications require two parts one part is an aesthetic ui part and one part is a functional server calculation part and those are linked together to create the application as a whole so if i use this what we've got on screen as an example. Um, this is the application that comes up when you first create an R Shiny app. Um, it's their basic example of what you can do, a uh, simple application. So when you move the blue slider on the left, the plot next to it changes. And um, this is, as with all R Shiny apps, is made with UI and server parts together. Um, so on the left here, I've got the UI part, so you can see it. Um, there's a title panic, uh, panic, <laughs> title panel that says old, faithful, geyser, geyser, data. Don't know how to say it probably. <laughs> and you've got the sidebar that has your kind of slider in it um, in the little grayed out box. And then you've got the main panel bit, which is the rest of the screen that has the plot in it. So that's the UI bit. And it basically contains everything you can see visually. Uh, with just the UI bit, you can see everything, 
but nothing is calculated so the plot wouldn't exist and when you slid the the bin slider the slider would change but it wouldn't be linked to anything at all um this side here that i've just put on is the server bit um and the the only thing that's in this server section is creating a plot um and that's the calculating bit so it takes in bits of information and creates a plot um so these are connected together then by the colorful sections i just thrown up so the orange things there are um the slider is labeled as bins that can be used within the server rather than the ui um in the orange on the right to um put in the input that you've you've slid to and uh, use that in the generation of the calculated plot. So that then the server generates based on information fed to it by the bins slider, a graph, which is then displayed through the blue sections in the UI section, the plot output. Uh, it displays the disk plot, which is the output in the server side. So it's all kind of mishmashed together. Um, and that's the difficulty uh, with our shiny applications is finding those connections, how to do it properly and how to do it. So nothing slips, <laughs> basically. Um, so getting back to, to my specific example, uh, I wanted to add a front page in which the first thing you want to do was upload the file you wanted to generate graphs from. So I added kind of a front page. Um, so it's just an extra tab. And then I included a file input thing. Uh, fortunately, this is something people have wanted to do and do regularly <laughs> uh, because there's a function called file input, which allows you to upload files into your application. Um, and so there are many ways you could then use it. You can save it off. You can utilize it in the application like I'm doing, et cetera. Um, so that's simple enough. And it, it shows this little, exactly as you would expect, a, um, a box where you can browse your files and call those in. There's only one feature to, feature to include. And there's actually a function designed for it. Relatively simple to generate the UI. However, um, once you've done this, um, you have to link this UI code to the server aspect. If you don't link them together, um, then clicking upload in this won't do anything. Um, it doesn't generate anything. It just sits there looking nice um, and looking like you can do something, but not actually doing anything in the background. Uh, so you need to link it to the server. And, and that's where the trouble is. So the server is the thinking bit, knows what to do, or you tell it what to do with the information and it runs off and plugs the information into what you need. Um, so in order to connect those things together, I had to rewrite my script. Uh, so it went from a very, very simple kind of read CSV file, um, one line to import the extract to a slightly less simple, um, but still not massive, a uh, couple of lines of code. Um, it it made a reactive file um, that was, so a reactive file is one that when you change it, other things update um, rather than assuming that the first time you upload something, the first time you use something is the last time it needs to look at it. Um, and it, creates a file that is reactive based on what you have put into your UI. Um, so that's um, the file section here, the, the data path, uh, reading in that, that CSV file. Um, so actually wasn't too tricky, um, but uh, in testing this, I found a bunch of issues in the data cleaning. Um, part of this was because I wanted to make sure that uh, you could, uh, the user can upload both CSV and Excel files. 
um, people tend to have preferences in these kind of things. So I wanted to make sure they could do either. But the application had been using a specific file type, uh, CSV. Uh, and actually, if you upload an Excel file into it, then the formatting wasn't right when you did it via Excel. Uh, so I was able to change this. So all I had to do, all I had to do <laughs> was add in a bit of an if else statement an if else statement, which meant that it looked at the extension and if it was CSV file, it uploaded and did nothing the same as usual. And if it was not a CSV file, if it was an Excel file, then it would do some extra data formatting before it went any further. Um, and in kind of working out a bit more about the file input function, I found you could upload more than one thing at a time. So I was able to update my code to ensure that if there was more than one file, uh, you could, um, using a simple kind of for loop, bind those files together and, for example, display uh, data from hospitals uh, in the same health board um, trust uh, to kind of compare them to look at everything as a, a whole and see the general performance um, or the, the general places where improvements could happen. Um, and um, I tried to connect this in. Uh, when I tried the graphs elsewhere, they um, didn't work. And the reason for that was because I had left the old data source <laughs> links. <laughs> so I need, they needed to be reconnected to the reactive data source rather than the static one that I'd done before. Um, it took a while to understand what it was going on, <laughs> what was going wrong. Um, and it is more to do with just finding where these things are impacting and changing things appropriately rather than it being difficult to change them. Um, but I'm still kind of entangling this because it was my first coding project. And whilst I'm going through and changing the data sources, I'm trying to also alter my inefficient code. So that's my own bad. <laughs> but um, that's that's where I am at the moment. So that's where I'm going to stop and say, are there any questions? Um, obviously, I, as a, a pre-recorded figure, will not be able to answer them. But I'm hoping you'll be able to crowdsource the answers or get in touch with me or my team. Um, I'm also available on the NHSR kind of Slack channels and things like that. Um, so feel free to get in touch. Thank you. Hi everyone, it's me again. I've just done a presentation on adapting a dashboard to include a file input um, and I'm back. <laughs> I hope you're not sick of me uh, and um, I'm going to do another one on adapting our code from GitHub to work with my data. Um, in case you're new, uh, in right now. Uh, my name is Jessica Pang. I'm an analyst in Improve Montgomery and Public Health Wales, and I've worked there for eight years. Um, I'm sorry if people have just heard that 10 minutes ago, but in case anyone else has joined, that's who I am. Uh, so I'll try and dive right in a bit more with this one uh, and kind of talk about the background. Um, so uh, here we go. Um, it all started last year at Insight 2021. Um, I, I'm setting the scene, uh, and, and uh, that um, event, that, that presentation uh, is available on YouTube uh, and the links are in the slides. Feel free to get in contact with me on Slack to get these. Um, I don't know whether they're going to be shared afterwards, possibly. Um, but anyway, I saw the fantastic talk, which is this one, data for the head, stories for the heart, uh, looking at some of the metrics used in the strategy unit report on deaths and end of people's lives. Um, this looked at data reflecting the last few years of a person's life, stratified by chronic conditions and other factors. And the presentation talked about looking at individual stories that reflected 
of the data and telling those stories about individuals. Uh, so that would show the meaning of those metrics and bring home key messages from the analysis, spark change through storytelling. The whole presentation was really good, really enjoyed it. Uh, thoroughly recommend, but one particular image really caught my eye and I really wanted uh, to have a go at it. <laughs> um, and uh, oh yeah, this is what it was. Um, what I liked about this, um, what I'm going to call a barcode graph, just because that's what it reminds me of, um, was that it was really easy to read and despite there being a lot of information in it, it is really, yeah, human readable. Um, it goes from left to right. Each of the lines represent interaction with the healthcare service, with the leftmost being the a year from someone's death and the lines representing the interactions with the healthcare service different colours representing different services or interactions. I just really found it a, a nice visualisation to summarise quite a lot of the information. And so I wanted to try it out. It's it's as simple as that, really. Um, however, coming from presentation and not really knowing how it was done, because it was focusing on that storytelling aspect, how to generate change rather than the code, uh, how you made it, uh, that kind of thing. I was a, a little bit lost. Um, I started thinking about this, um, but I wasn't really sure uh, where to begin. Um, and I was just kind of following my instincts as to what would make some sense. Uh, so my first instinct was to try and understand how to pull the right data out and join it together. So this was my go at that. Um, I've really written this so it's not actually data, but you get the picture of what I was pulling out of the data set, the date of the interaction, the service or type of interaction, the description of the urgencies, specialty kind of thing, and uh, some calculated field, one calculated field, um, that pulled that data out in a, what I consider a more user-friendly way, analyst-friendly way. Um, and then I tried to manually create the the barcode graph um, and um, this was possible. I, I, I got something out, but um, the way that I did it was really wholly unsustainable and not very useful at all. Um, I ended up getting a bit lost on, on deduplication um, and uh, I wanted to show other people of the team like this as a a concept, so I, I really did want an example of the style. Um, so I ended up kind of manually copying and pasting lines that were useful, um, and I <laughs> manually kind of putting them together. Um, absolutely not something that was automatic. Absolutely no good, really. <laughs> but it must be possible. I knew it must be possible because I'd seen it happen. And I was relatively sure that it wouldn't have been someone else doing what I was doing here. So <laughs> that's how you know you're doing it wrong. <laughs> um, so whilst I had been wasting time in Excel, basically, I did email the, the strategy unit team um, that were responsible for this original report and kind of asked, how have you done this? What functions have you used? Tell me your secrets. Tell me a bit about your code. And I did receive a response for them, which was basically everything's on GitHub. Uh, and I was like, oh, thank goodness. Uh, amazing. I'm super happy. <laughs> thank goodness. Uh, GitHub to the rescue. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to see it. Um, this is the strategy unit GitHub page. Had some issues with it coming up a bit wrong, but um, on their strategy unit GitHub page, if you can't see it, um, there is everything in this report. There's a there's a repository for the report um, with all of the code in it. Um, and I was so pleased I had access to the code. And um, I'm still pleased, to be honest. It made everything much easier. And the only problem I had with it was that the code for the report, um, this was the code for the report. So I had to kind of pick out the right section by doing a bit of a comparison, finding the bit that related to this, which was actually in a slightly separate file. Uh, so it's just a bit fiddly 
trying to work out which bit was where. Um, but when I picked that out, um, amazing, I was happy with that. Um, then though I had a, a bit of another obstacle. <laughs> uh, I picked my data out and I found this code, um, but I found that I couldn't smush them together. So <laughs> the format of my data didn't fit the format that went into the specific function that they were using. Um, it was just different. It, it had to be done in a different way. And so I was still happy that I'd found the code, but unhappy that I was going to have to you know, change a bunch of different things. Um, but before I completely redid the formatting, I turned to my old friend, I think probably many of our old friends, Google, uh, and armed with the knowledge of what I wanted to do and the functions that had produced something similar, I was able to find something on Stack Overflow. Uh, again, an old friend. Um, and again, if you want the links, <laughs> just get in contact with me. <laughs> um, and I was able to find something that worked better or not better that worked for my specific format of data um, it was uh, so the original function that was used to create these was geom tile uh, that's what was used in the original report um, but I was hoping there would be something better um, that I didn't have to change everything for um, I'm not really sure of the, the differences between geom tile and what I actually came to use in the end, which was geom rect. Um, it's possible that there were different reasons that I should be using geom tile and I should have a go at restructuring my data. Um, I'm not sure of those differences. If there are some, uh, this allowed me to do what I needed to. <laughs> so uh, I haven't used um, anything else because this worked. Um, I haven't used it in practice yet, except to display that it's possible. So whilst I think it would be useful, it has there hasn't been any problems. There hasn't ha been a chance for there to be any problems. Um, so uh, this works for me and I was able to use this to configure code that works with my data sets. Uh, and um, that is this code. Uh, so I this, the way this works is that it produces a random sample of 15 um, in any of you filter it however you want and then it produces 15 of those filtered data set in a random sample and the barcodes um, run through ggplot the geomrec file and a bunch of theming um, to produce these barcodes, sorry. Uh, and that's not particularly long or complex bit of code. Most of the screen is taking up with theming stuff, but um, I produced it. <laughs> uh, and uh, here it is. Uh, and I'm not trying to say that the colors that I've used are good. <laughs> I'm not trying to say that my formatting has gone very well, because I, I think it's, it's a lot of work that could be done there. But what they are doing is working. So I'm able to produce these kind of graphs now, and I would be able to in different contexts if if the um, these kind of opportunities prevent themselves um, through the efforts of other people, basically, and standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, which really, this presentation more than anything else is a a tribute to to colleagues who want to share code, use GitHub, and do some detective work in general. And and my side was detective work in this case. Um, we still have issues with using GitHub, um, which I hope will be resol resolved soon because I really would love to be able to share uh, and be able to, um, you know, do the same for other people as I was able to get out of this. So um, again, uh, if anyone's got any questions, I'm hoping that, you know, the people that are there live uh, will help answer. Um, I am still not present, actually. <laughs> um, so hopefully there'll be people who can um, talk to each other, answer questions. Uh, and again, kind of thank you for listening. That's great, thank you. Um, Jessica, 
it, it's quite an art really i think or a craft to be able to speak pre-record and still kind of be in the moment and engaging and a sense of passion and joy of learning coming across so so that's great to see actually um uh, and then our next speaker actually our next two speakers will be a uh, guest joining us from the united states so i'd like to hand over if i may to shannon please shannon do introduce yourself uh, and take the floor thanks very much My name is Shannon Pileggi, and um, I am joined by my colleague, Daniel Soberg, who may or may not be on video. Um, he'll be happy to answer any questions in the chat. Um, I am based in the U.S., so I do work for the Prostate Cancer Clinical Trials Consortium, which is a clinical research organization housed under Memorial Sloan Kettering, and Daniel's at, also at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Would you like me to wait until... Uh, nine o'clock, or sorry, nine o'clock my time on the dot. Two more minutes before I officially start. Uh, oh, oh no, we've been going for most of the morning already, uh, Shannon. Okay. So just take take the extra two minutes if you may right. to speak. Sounds yeah, good. Great. Thank you. All right. So now I'm all arranged and set up. And so today I'm going to be talking to you about a package that Daniel and I uh, produced called GTREG, which is for regulatory tables for clinical research. I hope some of you in the audience today may find this helpful for you. You're welcome to pop in questions in the chat as we go. Uh, so for an introduction, um, Daniel and I are the developers. You can find us on Twitter, maybe now Mastodon, LinkedIn. You can follow us on GitHub and our personal websites as well. So for an overview of our package, GTREG is a package that is built on GT summary. That is a package that is built on GT, which means that all of the tables that we produce are highly customizable and extensible. And here's an overview of what's inside the package. So for our core GT reg functions, uh, we have some functions to help with tabling of adverse events. And then we have some other functions as well to produce other types of tables like standard summary tables and listings as well. We can also convert those uh, to um, table shells using style XX. Once we have our base table, we can then modify the table using GT summary modification functions like modify header. And the way that we specify those modifications is by using column selectors in GTREG. And lastly, we can export these tables to various formats like HTML, Word, PDF, Excel. So let's introduce the idea of adverse events. So an adverse event is a medical issue that occurs during the course of treatment or observation. And these adverse events are classified according to our hierarchy. So here we have our system organ class is our uh, higher level term and our adverse event is our lower level term here. We're typically going to report lower level terms within that system organ class. And we also record other features about that adverse event like severity or grade here is measured numerically from one to five or likelihood of attribution to a treatment over here. And you'll note here that this is the same patient that has five different adverse events recorded. So when we summarize this, there's a lot of challenges. So as you see already, subjects experience multiple adverse events. Not all enrolled subjects experience an adverse event. And we're often interested in computing the percent of subjects experiencing specific adverse events. And in order to do so, we count those by maximum grade per subject. And I'll come back to that in the next slide. And then on top of that, we actually have to do this a lot in different ways over the course of our clinical reporting. So we actually require multiple adverse event tables like treatment emergent adverse events, adverse events on specific treatment cycles and serious adverse events. We have to do it over and over again. So what does counting by maximum grade here mean? We have five different uh, adverse events and you can see these adverse events are actually three different terms. We have Two, one event of anemia, two events of increased tendency to bruise, and two events of thrombocytopenia. So when we count by a maximum grade, that means that for each term, we're gonna take count in our tabulation, the largest grade observed, as shown in the highlighting here. And similar logic applies when we count by severity, like mild, moderate, severe. 
If that variable is stored as a factor in R, then the highest factor level is retained, like severe. So let's get into how you're going to make your first adverse event tables. Obviously, we're going to need some data. So this data comes in our GT reg package. We have two primary data sets. The first one is DF adverse events, which has 10 unique subjects and multiple rows per subject, simulating adverse events over the course of treatment or over time. The second data set we have is DF patient characteristics, which has 100 unique subjects and one row per subject. So let that sink in for a minute. We have 100 subjects of interest and only 10 of them actually experience adverse events. Another attribute or feature that you'll see in our data is that our data does have variable labels. And a variable label is an attribute of a variable in a data frame. And we're applicable in our tabling packages like GT summary and GT reg, you will see variable labels printed and not variable names. You can also set variable labels in your own data set using label to set variable labels. You can see this if you look at the stir of your data set. So here we have a variable that is lowercase h, and then the variable label for it is patient age. Again, you can also see that if you view the data set in your RStudio viewer, will you see the variable name on top and the variable label on the bottom? Uh, due to the brevity of this talk, uh, for tabling adverse events, I'm only going to present table AE, which is our primary workhorse function. What table AE does is it counts adverse events per subject by maximum grade. So here I'm taking our DF adverse events data set, typing it into the table AE function, and I'm specifying four things. The unique patient identifier in ID, the lower level term for the adverse event in AE, the system organ class variable in the SOC, and how I want that tabulated. In this case, I want it tabulated by grade. The resulting table is this. So here we can see our system organ classes at the top level. Our lower level terms are automatically indented underneath those system organ classes. And since we specified by grade, you see those grade values across the top. Now, one feature that you might notice already is that we have a subsample size here of n equals 10, because in this case, 10 people experienced adverse events in our DF adverse events data set. But we know that we have 100 people at risk for experiencing adverse events, so we want to correct for that. The way we're going to do that is we're going to supply another argument called IDDF. That's our ID data frame to achieve the correct subject denominator. So this takes a separate data frame, when in this case is DF patient characteristics. I'm going to switch over to the data so you can see this. So we're supplying DF adverse events to table AE and DF patient characteristics to IDDF. And what's important is that the patient identifier matches between these two. When now when we supply IDDF, our table can adjust the denominator so that we can see the correct total number of subjects at risk on the top. And we also have adjusted our percents. So seven out of 100 is 7% of subjects experienced grade five blood and lymphatic system disorders. Another thing you can do in tabling is add a stratification variable or treatment. So in our data, this was called treatment. So we had treatment in both our DF adverse events and in our patient characteristics indicating which therapy the patient is on. And when we do that, we're adding another level of um, tabling uh, so now our adverse events are separated by drug A and drug B. Of course, people always want to tweak their tables and modify them to get them looking exactly as they need. So how are we going to do that? This is where we're going to use our modify functions and other styling functions in, in conjunction with GT red column selectors. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add an overall column. In this case, I'm specifying across equals by, and I'm going to bold labels. The result of this is that now bolding labels makes our system organ class um, values bolded so that they pop on your table. And we've also added overall in, uh, across equals by. So this means we're summarizing across the by values of grade here within each treatment regimen. There are different ways that you can uh, in, 
add an overall column. I think we have uh, four different ways to specify overall tabulation. So I encourage you to look at the documentation for more details. Of course, people always want to modify their headers as well. If we go back to the previous table, uh, we can see that this is one, two, three, four, five, but with really without any context. Um, and maybe people will want to look at their treatment regimen and sample size a little bit differently as well. So that's where these modify functions are going to come in. Um, and again, I'll flip back to the side one more time. Um, we have modify header and modify spanning header. So this top level header here, that's our spanning header because it spans the different grades. And then modify header is our lower level here, lower level header here. So two different headers to modify. So we're going to modify that lower level header that specified the by values of grade. We're going to say we want to do this for all of the adverse event columns that we have. And instead of just printing that numeric value, which is piped in you know, using the curly braces uh, and the variable by, uh, and we're going to print out the word grade. And we're also going to modify the spanning header too. We're going to do this for all adverse event columns. And here we're doing this um, for both uh, unknown columns and overall columns. That's what the true true means. And in this case, we're um, putting our sample size on a new line by doing two spaces and then return carriage in. So the returning uh, resulting table is this. Now, instead of just numeric values for grade printed as one, two, three, four, five, we see the grade label and we see our um, sample size on a new line underneath the treatment regimen. Uh, we have a full, fully fledged article on how to do this and table modifications. We also have other tabling functions. So table reg summary, table listing, and style XXX. So table reg summary is going to create summary tables with standard regulatory formatting. So this is like get adverse events out of your brain. What if I just want like a summary table? And one feature of the summary table is that continuous values, our variables are often reported on multi-line um, summaries. So here, I'm just going back to our DF patient characteristics data set. I'm getting our drug, our treatment, our marker, which is a continuous variable, and our status, which is a um, categorical variable. And we want to table that. So I'm pulling that in to table reg summary, and I'm summarizing by treatment. The resulting table gives you a multi automatic multi-line summary for continuous variables and a standard summary for categorical variables. We also really enjoy table listing, which is a fancy way to print grouped data. Um, so if I'm going to go over to my data tab so you can see what I mean here, um, what if I just want to print out like raw data values, like not actually summarize it, but I, they are grouped naturally. So in case these are the raw data values I want to print. I want to print a few adverse events, and I want them to be grouped by system organ class so that they're easily read. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm doing group by system organ class, and here's the resulting table that kind of gives you that bolded header, and then the values underneath are indented that belong to that grouping. And I'm going to go back to this table that we observed earlier when I was explaining maximum grade counting. So this is actually produced from table listing. If we look at the data behind this, I created a new variable that was term one, term two, term three. And then I grouped it by that term in order to achieve this grouped listing look. But on top of that, because GT summary was built on G, or because GT reg was built on GT summary, was built on GT, we can also leverage GT functions to apply additional styling to our table. So that's how I achieved the highlighting here. Um, so we're going to convert this table to GT and then use GT functions to achieve the highlighting. We can also convert these tables to table shells uh, using the style XXX function. So the way you're going to do this, um, we're going to do this for table AE or table reg summary. We also have a vignette on how to do this for more information. But basically, you need data. So you're either going to create dummy data or bring your own data. You're going to pass the data to the function of your choice, and then you're going to overwrite the statistics shown. So it doesn't matter what's in the data itself. We're just going to overwrite the value shown using style xxx function in the digits argument. So what the style xxx function is, it replaces the numeric value with x's. 
Um, the default is just going to be two lowercase x's, but you can also format that to look like a decimal, like xx.x. When I say uniform shell, I mean I want all the x's to look the same, like no decimal specification here and, and not he in other places. Um, so that's what a uniform table shell means. Um, and in order to achieve this for table AE, I'm going to specify my digits to have a styling of XXX. It's also important that you make your zero symbol null. That's going to allow it to apply the X's to zeros rather than have N dashes in your table. And I'm also going to overwrite those um, sample sizes with XX using my modify spanning header as well. So the resulting table is here, a bunch of X's for your table shells. Um, if you want to customize this so that maybe percents can show a decimal place, I'll refer you to the vignette for that. For exporting options, we love our tables and we love working with them of R, but obviously we have to get them out of R at some point. And so we can do this in various ways. Um, we're leveraging a lot of GT summary functions here. So HTML is going to be your default output. You can also output to Word using flex table. You can also output to Excel using Huxtable, and you can also output to PDF using Cable Extra. It's fairly simple, and the, for the most part, all of the formatting is retained. So all of the spacings, the indentations, the bolds, everything that you have specified is generally retained across the different formats. Um, so that's a nice feature as well. So if you want more information, I encourage you to go to our package down website. GTRAG is on CRAN, so you can install it from CRAN, or you can install the development version from GitHub. If you have any issues with GTRAG, you're welcome to file them on the GitHub issues. And if you have any feature, quests, this question, feature requests, questions, or things you want to know if possible, feel free to pop those in the discussions as well. So thank you for listening. Shannon, thank you very much indeed. There's, uh... Uh, a, a lot of a lot of applause. Uh, I can remember the time when uh, R was really, really, really hard work for tables, and so uh, your your contribution contributions. Lots of other people are making it a, a very attractive tool. In fact, one comment was that um, it could be great for people who uh, are looking to publish uh, papers with academic journals, and there's always a table one and a table two. Yeah, so if you're not doing adverse events at all, I highly, highly encourage you to go to GT Summary, which GT Reg is built on GT Summary, but GT Summary is wonderful for those publications. That's great, Shannon. Thank you. Uh, Shannon, also, thank you for keeping to time. So uh, uh, our next speaker uh, I'd like to introduce is uh, Jenny Sloan, who's also from the US uh, and will be talking to us about uh, tips and insights into teaching R to beginners and of course we were all beginners once so it's always nice to uh, to hear these things uh, and there's always new beginners coming along uh, in fact that uh, they're amongst our favorites in the NHSL community um, so over to Jenny please thank you yes thank you so much for having me um, yes my name is Jenny Sloan and uh, I am currently in Houston so I recently I guess my background is in cognitive psychology. I recently finished my PhD over in Australia. I was at University of New South Wales. Back in the States now, I'm doing a postdoc um, at the Houston VA and Baylor College of Medicine. So my research right now is focused on patient safety. And the title of my talk is slightly different, um, but I'll be talking today about um, some of my experiences and tips for going about teaching art to beginners. And you'll see throughout my presentation, I have a lot of incredible, beautiful illustra illustrations. It's all, all of them are made by Alison Forst. I definitely encourage you, if you don't know about her, to check out, uh, just Google and have a look. They're awesome. Uh, so I hope you enjoy all the artwork throughout. Okay, so just to quickly give an overview, I will spend some time at the beginning talking about my experiences teaching R, and then from those experiences, I'll share some general tips in case you're interested in either learning R or teaching R to others. And finally, I'll end with 
providing quite a few different resources because I know that there's limited time, but I want to give you as much as many possible resources as possible. Okay, so I'll share a few of my experiences teaching R. So the first one, I one of my friends and I decided to lead several workshops on introduction to R and data science to a group of secondary school students. And this was really fun for us because we kind of came up and volunteered our time. So we got to design this completely ourselves. And we we actually reached out to the students ahead of time. And um, not so surprisingly, we found out that there was a lot of interest in sports and, and also importantly, climate change. So we decided to create kind of like a final project for the students to work towards where they would get in small groups and come up with research questions related to these data sets that we've kind of hand selected for them. One was on uh, Olympic data set, and then one was on annual rainfall in Australia. And then using R, which they've never used before, we kind of gave this ambitious goal to analyze data and create beautiful graphs. So just to show you what the students were able to achieve, and honestly, it was just four or five workshops, they made these really awesome graphs. Um, to answer their specific research questions that they came up with. So on the left, we can see that they're plotting the average height of different athletes over, uh, over the years. And then on the right, this is looking at the um, rainfall data set. So plotting average rainfall in different cities uh, in Australia. Uh, another opportunity I had was to mentor a group of year 11 high school students on, this is a was a pretty intensive one week summer school on cognitive psychology. And we tried to cram quite a lot into one week, but here again, this was, I was able to design this completely from scratch. So I thought it would be really, a really great experience for the students to each be able to come up and generate their own hypothesis related to psychology experiments that I had programmed. We actually ran, collected the data, and then using that data, all of the students were then able to use R and graph and analyze and even run some stats on the results. So just as one quick example, one student came up with this specific question looking at um, kind of this a correlation here, can higher scores on an impulsivity scale be associated with one of the big five personality traits of extroversion? And she did quite a few analyses, but uh, one of the plots that was her favorite, and I agree, was this uh, box plot. And then the last experience I'll share, um, I also had the opportunity to help teach a psychology course at the University of New South Wales. So this was, of course, for university students who, again, most of them have never had any experience with programming or coding. And here, this course was awesome. Um, it was very different from any psych course that I've ever taken. But the goal, this course was all about open science and um, reproducibility. So again, students were put into small groups and they were given one uh, published research article, and they were they had this really ambitious goal to try to reproduce the results and figures from this published article. So, as just one example, this this was one of the graphs um, from the original paper, and the students did have the raw data. And just to show you what the students came up with. Here is on the left, you can see their code and it looks identical. So just to go back, you can see the original compared to what they were able to reproduce. And of course, this was over a longer period of time. They had the entire term to kind of work together, but you know, I was totally blown away and I learned a lot from this course as well. So with, with all of 
my experience, my experience working and teaching other students, there are a few tips that I thought it would be useful to share. And uh, the first one, um, don't skip over the basics. I know it can be easy to get really excited about all the incredible features of R. And for me, the data visualization is one of them. But I definitely recommend taking time to go and make sure you understand the fundamentals first. So it's like things such as knowing the difference between R versus R Studio, even though chances are, if you're like me, you never even open up R, you only use R Studio. Knowing the different files, uh, if you're using RMD files, still having that background of what an R file is and what the differences are. Also, if you're using RMD files, of course, you want to take time to really understand the R Markdown language. When you open up R Studio, it's definitely for the first time, it can be very overwhelming, but it's really important to understand what all of the different panes are um, because they are, they do all have incredibly useful functions, um, of course. Knowing the difference between installing versus loading packages and and here, one thing I realized is a lot of times, um, especially beginners, if, if you try to use that install.packages function, it won't work. And beginners, you know, you have no idea why. Why are you getting this error that says this package doesn't exist? What do you do? So just being able to understand what CRAN packages are, and if it's not on CRAN, how do you install the packages, you know, via GitHub? Um, is in, an incredibly useful to know at the start of your journey. Working directories, this for me, I remember when I learned several years ago, I had I struggled to understand working directories and the, how the file structure works. Now I know about R projects and my life has changed forever. I use R projects pretty much with everything that I do, but still having that again, basic, the foundation of knowing what a working directory is, how to get to the um, correct path. You can't really do anything in R if you can't open up your file path, right? You have to make sure you know where you're working. And then of course, things like variable, variable types, data frames or tables if you're in tidyverse uh, and functions. Okay, so this you probably may have picked up from when I was sharing about the different my different experiences, but having a concrete project when you're learning something new is so, so important. And I think everyone can probably relate to this until you have your own project where you can apply these new skills. It really doesn't sink in as well. So definitely even... If it's a project that's not going to go anywhere, it doesn't matter, it's just for fun, you will learn so much more, I promise. If you're teaching students or other or other individuals, colleagues, definitely consider the age and if they have any prior coding experience, even if it's not in R, that will, you just wanna make sure to adjust your teaching style and the content. And, just be prepared to be amazed, especially students. They're so good with technology. It's it's actually really incredible. Um, they'll learn so quickly and you'll just learn so much in the process as well. And now on the flip side, if you're the learner, I guess my biggest piece of advice is just be patient. You know, everyone who programs will say learning um, any programming language is has a steep learning curve. So just take it one day at a time. And really enjoy being part of the R community. As you can see from this conference, the R community is just incredible. And there are always people there who you can find on Twitter or online who can always answer your questions and are incredibly supportive. And this is one of my favorite illustrations from Allison. It kind of just shows no matter where you are in your R journey, it's a roller coaster. You know, some days, going to be like the highest of the highs. You'll have no errors, which maybe not no errors, but it will be a really good day of coding. And then you'll run into an obstacle and you'll kind of feel stuck and frustrated. I want to break your computer, but 
I promise we all go through that and you'll you'll figure out a solution in the end. So I just encourage you to try to enjoy the ride as you go. Okay, and in the last few minutes, I do just want to share some resources. And I guess one more piece of advice, if you're teaching or mentoring, before you spend hours trying to create content, see what's already out there, because there are so many amazing blogs and tutorials. Uh, it might not be worth your time to go and try to create something from scratch. And so these are just a few that I've had a lot of experience working with. I'll just put them all up on the screen for now. Um, again, I was in Australia and I was really fortunate to be at a university with so many incredible, incredibly talented individuals who, um, for example, this, this first link is a series of online tutorials created by members of Our Lady Sydney. It's called Are You With Me? This is excellent for beginners. If you've never programmed, I do recommend checking that out. If you want something a bit more advanced, but still aim towards beginners, um, Danielle Navarro, who is an, uh, also just incredible data scientist, researcher, everything. She has quite a few YouTube playlists and tutorials that you can go through. If you're looking for um, more of a book or an online book to go and go through at your own pace are for data science. I know that's hugely popular. I've spent a lot of time going through that myself. And I was also involved at my university. Uh, we created this group called the USW Coders. And so I'm happy to share this, these slides and everything after this presentation with anyone who wants, but you're welcome to check out that website. They have awesome workshops that they put on every once or twice a month um, and everything's recorded. So you can see if there's anything of interest to you. And then of course you have your online courses. Uh, some are free, some you have to pay, uh, but things like Code Academy, Udemy, Coursera, I've used all of these for different reasons. So it's just finding the best fit for you. And then with that being said, I didn't really take my own advice because I decided to take everything that I learned and spent some time putting it together. It started as a blog, it turned into YouTube tutorials, um, really on introduction to R. And then more recently, now I've been working on compiling everything that I've been working on for the past few years into a website that is called R for Beginners. And so let me see, uh, I, I'll just leave the website up here, but please check it out. This is a work in progress and, you know, I love to collaborate with people. So if anyone has ideas or suggestions um, for any of this, or if you just want to reach out and chat about anything, please feel free to contact me anytime. And with that, thank you so much um, for listening. Uh, Jenny, thank you so much. Um, uh, just uh, there is a comment which uh, was about um, somebody who's going to teach a, a, a two-hour practical uh, to uh, medical consultants. It sounds like it might be the first time. So they've asked how they, they might help students get set up before the workshop. Okay, yes, that, that's a great question. So I think the first thing, if there's any way um, you're able to utilize our studio cloud, um, especially if it's beginners for people who've never used R, I do recommend that. Uh, I used our studio cloud in most, whatever I had the ability to. It does cost a little bit of money, but if you're an instructor, you can get pretty reasonable prices. And, and I just say that because if you're using the cloud, it kind of bypasses all of like the initial headaches of getting things installed and a lot of different troubleshooting that goes on at the beginning. And it just keeps everyone on the same page. Um, so that I guess would be my biggest piece of advice. If not, if, if, if it's possible, just try to have everyone get everything set up ahead of time. So by the time you actually start the workshop or, or seminar, uh, you know that 
everyone's on the same page and ready to go and you don't have to spend, you know, 15, 20 minutes dealing with uh, troubleshooting. Thank you. Uh, perhaps I should just clarify that the NHSR community does have an Our Studio Cloud account. So if you just reach out to us through the NHSR inbox, uh, and if it's training that's being given to NHS public sector and so on, and then we usually find a way for you to be able to use the Our Studio account. Um, so with that comment and those thoughts, um, a just a big, big thank you really to all our speakers who each one of them in their own ways, I think leave me feeling uh, excited and inspired by what they've done. And actually in awe actually with, of all the kind of different things people have contributed on a, on a voluntary uh, basis. Um, a big thank you to all our attendees for your questions and comments and engagement. And then uh, just a quick reminder that we'll kick off again tomorrow for the last day of our online talks. We'll start around 10.55 um, and we have approximately eight talks tomorrow. Um, so thank you everybody for joining. Uh, the session today has now uh, concluded. So please feel free to leave. Thank you very much.